Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of TJLC Explained. My name is Rebecca and before I get into anything else I just want to say a huge thank you for the amazing response on the last video. It was beyond anything I expected and I'm just so glad people connected with the idea and the format and I really hope you continue to enjoy the series. Like I said last time, today's video is going to tackle the but they said argument. Thank you to Confirm John Luck for suggesting the topic. I actually think it's really good to tackle this early on because this seems to be the thing that discourages people that otherwise completely believe in TJLC. Almost every time the writers or actors come out saying something, I see people becoming discouraged and worrying that John Locke won't happen. So if you're one of those people, or if this argument is being used against you, I hope this video can help dispel some of your fears. TJLC is real. The first thing I actually want to say before I get to my counter argument is that ultimately, it doesn't matter what they say. Even if they didn't frequently admit that they're liars, which they do, or that they're planning a surprise, which they have, the contents of the show itself are enough to cancel out any argument against John Locke based on the interviews. Because every scene and episode and plot line builds up to John and Sherlock's inevitable union, and that does not happen by accident, especially with people who care as much as the people making Sherlock obviously do. This is the closest to being a genuine conspiracy that TJLC actually gets, because you have to believe that everyone involved is hiding the truth. It's not a stretch to believe it though, because the writers have told us time and again that they're doing it. I mean, just a few months ago, the writers were swearing up and down that the special was going to be a completely standalone episode having nothing to do with the rest of the series. You can expect Victorian Sherlock Holmes, Victorian Sherlock Holmes. If I, we checked the books, it turns out he wasn't a modern detective at all. He was a Victorian detective. We should have read them more carefully. So we fixed that and uh, he's now a Victorian detective like he ought to be. We didn't believe them and we ended up being right. Stephen Moffat described their approach to interviews by saying, If I were organizing you a surprise party, which would be in itself a surprise, I suppose, and you ask me, are you organizing me a surprise party? I'd say no, because that's kind of what you do. Either we say nothing at all, we literally lock ourselves away, or we're not going to tell you what happens next. Of course not. Why would we do that? You wouldn't even like it if we did. And if that doesn't make it clear enough that there is a surprise being planned, there's a master plan, he said with a smile. There's a plan. There is a long-term plan. Very long-term. Here are a few other times that they've outright admitted to lying. Anything is possible but we do our best to surprise you with the combination of lies and deceit, so we're never going to tell you what we're going to do. And whether or not I'm telling the truth right now is another situation, he said. Virtue added, you do lie a lot, Stephen. And this moment where someone asked about Sherlock's sexuality and whether that mattered to them at all. Sherlock lives in his brain and everything else is transport, unless we're lying. Again. Which is key here, because if the big surprise is that this is going to be the first version of Sherlock Holmes with a canon relationship between Sherlock and John, they're going to throw as much confusion into the areas of their sexualities as they possibly can, both inside of the story and in interviews. So far they have two main strategies to accomplishing this, saying Sherlock is a sociopath and talking about Irene. The really wonderful thing is that they're so inconsistent about their lying that it makes it even more obvious that they're doing it. For example, Sherlock calls himself a sociopath a few times on the show, and occasionally Moffat will back him up on this. One of them is a high-functioning sociopath, the other one is a hobbit, let's not set the bar too high. <laughs> But most of the time, he says something closer to Sometimes, oddly enough, the film version of Sherlock Holmes made him much stranger than he is in the originals. In the originals, he's a man who keeps his emotions tightly under control because he wants his intellect to predominate that. That's all he is. He's not a freak of nature. He wasn't born this way. He made himself this way. He's even gone so far as to call it the ridiculousness of believing Sherlock or them that he's a sociopath. It's funny how people are always wanting to prove me wrong on this one. They say, but he's not a high-functioning sociopath. I never said he was. Sherlock Holmes tells people he is. Why would you listen to him? Nobody can define themselves. That's what he'd like people to think he is. And that's it. And I think he probably longs to be one. I think he loiters around prisons for the criminally insane, envying them of their emotional detachment. He knows emotion is a problem to him. A man who has decided to suppress all of his emotions in order to be better at what he does clearly has an awful lot of emotion. That's a pretty simple deduction. It clearly is a problem for him. So in itself, that is an emotional decision. In another interview, Moffat made it pretty clear about what kinds of emotions he's talking about here. Sherlock Holmes, again, must have sexual impulses, because human beings tend to. Most human beings, not absolutely all, but that's the majority. The fact is, he decides to put all of that in an iron box to make his brain work better. Of course, the fact that that iron box bounces around and shakes and bangs from the inside is what makes the story interesting. He wants to rise above us like a snow-capped mountain, but he's actually a volcano, and that's where the story is. That's where the story is. You know, you shove Irene Adler in front of him and he just falls apart like most men would. 
Which brings us to our other main tactic, them claiming Sherlock was in love with Irene Adler. It's equally unconvincing. There's the fact that after this, Moffat contradicted himself again and went back to saying that Sherlock doesn't feel anything. It's a funny thing when a character for over 100 years has been saying, I don't do that at all. He's been saying it over 100 years. He's not interested in sex. He's willfully staying away from that to keep his brain pure. A Victorian belief, that. But everyone wants to believe he's gay. He's not gay. He's not straight. Or this clip. He makes a complete fool of himself in a scandal in Belgravia. I quite like, I quite, I think the, the big moments of high drama in Sherlock Holmes's life are where his supreme reason doesn't work and we see the great heart come to rescue the day. And if you didn't notice, in there he references the moment I read from The Adventure of the Three Garadeds last episode, which is basically the John Locke moment of the original canon. By the way, earlier in the same interview, he stated this about the end of A Scandal in Belgravia. We actually don't know what happened. I quite like the mystery of it. It could be anything from me, he said, right? Don't ask me to do that again. I'm still terribly cross with you. I really goes off. Or they have a great time. Or every second Wednesday of every month they meet in a motel somewhere. To be honest, I think they've never saw each other again, is the truth. Finally on the topic, and this is my favorite, Moffat once again answered whether or not Sherlock's sexuality would be established on the show. Is Sherlock Holmes a virgin or not? You can't ever establish it. Oddly enough, they did the same thing in The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes. They had a scene which established that he had done the deed, but they cut it. Same thing. We just don't know. I personally can't imagine that he is, but you can't ever confirm it. Leaving aside that they're as inconsistent about Sherlock's past sexual experiences as anything else in this area, he made a reference to T-Plosh, which as we know is a movie where Sherlock is implied to be gay and where the director regrets not going further. So should we just ignore everything they say? Well, yes and no. Like I said at the beginning of the video, it ultimately doesn't matter what they say because the show speaks for itself, but we can still glean some interesting information from what they choose to say in public. One of the general rules of thumb is that things they said very early on in the process are much more likely to be truthful than things they say now that the show has become a massive hit. For example, most of the quotes I used in the last video were from early on in the process. We can also apply this to the actors too. Take Martin Freeman, for example, who went from saying this, It's the gayest story in the history of television. It's about the relationship between two men and how it develops and how it changes. It's about the things that wind each other up and the things they genuinely love about one another as well. We all certainly saw it as a love story. These two people do love and kind of need each other in a slightly dysfunctional way, but it is a relationship that works. They get results. In 2011, to becoming this just emotionally drained, empty person in more recent interviews. Why do you think fans have latched onto that relationship so strongly? I don't know. Why do you th I, I really don't know. It sounds like you're kind of um, denying things or, you know, somehow being homophobic if you say they're not actually f Do you know what I mean? They're not actually <laughs> fucking. I ne do you know what? I, I always over talk it and try and talk nonsense. But I don't know. Why do you think? Yeah, I suppose a relationship that is... Um, platonic but yet very sort of close in that way. There is something of the couple about it. And the thing is people are attracted to each other in all sorts of ways, you know what I mean? It's um... But, but platonic, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't, you know, you'd have to know. I, I'm just in it. Martin, what did they do to you? Are you, are you okay? They tend to be most honest when they're talking about their main priority for the series and where it's headed overall. Because all this inconsistency in answers doesn't mean there's not a plan. Not when the people involved care this much. Absolutely. I mean, it was key to us from the beginning to try and show people that it was being made by people who love Sherlock Holmes. There's nothing casual about it. Steve and I put an awful lot of work into devising the new world of Sherlock. What it does indicate is that there's something much bigger in the works. So what is the heart of their plan? What do they see as the center point of their show? You already know where this is going. You fall in love with the fact that they adore each other. These two extraordinary, brilliant opposites who have a simple, uncomplicated mutual affection that happened instantly and remained unchanged over decades and was never discussed at all. That's what people genuinely fall in love with. You cannot discuss Sherlock Holmes without discussing Dr. Watson. The two of them are an absolute unit. We often say it's a show about a detective, not a detective show. That's true of our version as well as Doyle's. The mystery generally takes a back seat to the atmosphere and character, and we've definitely discovered that's what people love the most. They do say friendship in these interviews, but where that friendship is going is the big surprise of the series. With the way the show has run so far, the friendship arc has already reached its peak. There's only one place they can take that relationship from here. And remember from last week that the BBC isn't interested in commissioning shows that just hint at a romance or where it ends tragically like in T-Plush. So there really is just one end in sight, and they've had everything for it planned from the very beginning. We've had certain aspects of what we're going to do mapped out for quite a long while. 
The return of Moriarty is not a last-minute whim. You'd have painted yourself into the most ludicrous corner. No, no, there's been... It was discussed ages ago. The Moriarty plan is known by a few others, but a lot else of the next two series is just me and Mark. Moriarty's death, not death, just plays into the rest of where they're going. Especially if you believe, like many people do, that Mary is either working for Moriarty or is actually the mastermind behind it all herself. Everything is building up to the moment when the surprise is finally revealed. Until then, they're going to do everything in their power to throw the audience off the scent, all the while secretly hinting at the truth. I'm going to conclude this argument with a quote that has actually convinced people of their plan rather than worrying them, and has kind of become a tagline for TJLC. So that moment, that the gut punch moment, is easy. It's building. Because you want, when, it, when a twist comes, it's not that it's surprising that is thrilling. It's the fact you go, I should have seen it. I was told. I was told repeatedly this doesn't make sense. And then the, the rug is pulled. It's like you've been warning them for ages. You know, we're going to pull this rug in a minute. We are. You aren't paying any attention, but we are going to pull this rug. And uh, so when you, when you fall over, you've got to think, I was told and I didn't listen. Right now, it's only a matter of waiting until the rug is pulled out from everyone's feet. Until then, we were told. And we were listening. So thank you for watching this video. I hope it lived up to your expectations. Like I said before, my next video is going to be the unaired pilot. I plan to do a longer form video on each episode of the series, but I want to break this up with shorter videos on smaller, more focused topics. Whether that be a particular scene, a running symbol in the show, or even a counter argument like this one. I have some ideas kicking around, but if you're really excited to see something, let me know in the comments below. Thank you again to Kara for suggesting this topic, and again to Stacy for editing the script for me. I consulted 57 Punches and Skulls and Tea to find sources for this video, and like last time, links to everything I've referenced can be found in the description below. I'll be back soon for a discussion on the Unheard Pilot. Until then, get ready to believe.